Hello and welcome. It's Francis here. Thank you for coming back to my channel. If this is your first time here, I think you're welcome. There is a subscribe button below if you would like to help support my channel by subscribing and also a bell to be notified as to when I upload more content. I'm coming to you from Ghana country and as such I acknowledge the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains as being the traditional custodians of the land upon which I preside. So I have a video for you that I've been trying to put together for the last couple of weeks and finally I have done it and it is on Pluto moving into Aquarius which I understand is actually happening tomorrow which here in Adelaide is the 19th so it may be the day later depending on where you are and this is something that astrologers have been talking about for a while and I'll sort of mention it as well and just a disclaimer I'm not an astrologer I just have a healthy interest in astrology and I do link and I will be linking below um, the astrologers that I've sort of gathered the information for this presentation on so I thought I'd put a few slides together and just sort of explain a little bit more about why this shift of Pluto from Capricorn where it has been since basically 2008 into Aquarius which is happening on the 19th as I said that's tomorrow where I'm living and but it's been doing this sort of like shuffle between Capricorn and Aquarius since I think March last year 2023 almost sort of giving us a little bit of an indication as to what we may be able to expect who knows so Pluto itself is a dwarf planet it was a planet was downgraded and from an astrological perspective and this is probably why it's hot topic at the moment it's all about transformation and as i said we've been sort of dipping our toes into aquarius pluto has and when it moves on the 19th into aquarius it's going to be staying here for the next basically 20 years until about 2043. So why don't we have a look at what this actually means and also to get some understanding as to what to expect looking at the past events that have happened each time Pluto has moved signs and in particular the last times it was in Aquarius. But first let us look at Pluto itself or himself. It is named after the Roman god of the underworld, the order of Tartarinus, which is one of, I think the Romans had a number of underworlds, and this is the infernal region and the underworld. He was also responsible for guarding the souls of the deceased. In astrology, Pluto is also connected with the sort of death and endings. So this is the association with the underworld. Transformation, as I mentioned, rebirth, trauma, deep ancestral wounds. These are all these things that will sort of from the dark aspect will be being brought up, sort of shadowy aspects will be brought up to the surface as well as inner strength. So we need to have inner strength in order to wrestle such dark things. So this is sort of like activating our inner shaman, which could be seen as the wealth that is also connected with Pluto the god, because we have the minerals and we have crystals and precious metals all come from the underworld. So everything is not all doom and gloom it really depends on how you look at transformation and change and we could be since it's been in um, Capricorn since 2008 it's almost like we've got very complacent with things and sometimes we need this shake up to see um, in order to move forward so Plato is also about power and control and how these can be used or exerted over other people 
even our own self. It's connected with the paranormal, uh, mental health issues. And these can be somewhat controversial because they're not always openly discussed or accepted, which because of that aspect tends to fall into Pluto's umbrella as connected with the underworld, the underworldly or out of sight aspects and instances in our lives, shall we say. So it's not all that strange when you consider this controversy about Pluto. Why, when we're looking at him as a planet, he sort of was a major planet one minute, then he was regraded down or regraded down to a dwarf planet, and then he's gone back up to a major planet. I really have no idea as to whether Pluto is perceived as a dwarf planet or a real planet these days. But this is something that echoes through even in the astrology. Pluto is about getting something only to lose it and you get it again. So there's a little bit of this toing and froing, and that's exactly what we have seen Pluto do since 2023, where it's sort of been toing and froing between this portal, shall we say, of Capricorn and Aquarius. So when it moves into Aquarius, it can bring about a lot of changes. And in doing so, I think this is one of the underlying aspects of Pluto, is the change, is the transformation, because it's also bringing up the raw truth, the real deep-seated soul focus, honesty, which is what we're seeing as it's beginning to move, well, it has been moving signs, and it's really beginning to gain a little bit of momentum, especially since it's been um, stationing um, direct as well. But being a slow-moving planet, because it's on the outer, it's the furthest planet from the sun, it does take a while, and this is why we are seeing so much sort of chaos happening, because it's like the wheels and motions are beginning to slowly turn. And it doesn't just affect us personally, it actually affects the collective, everybody, the whole consciousness. And this is what these outer planets do, Sagittarius, oh, sorry, um, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, always tend to have a wider aspect or connection to the collective than the inner personal planets, which are more about the individual like us. Pluto is also seen as a higher or a greater aspect of Mars. Mars is about the individual will. Pluto is about the collective will. So the collective will is beginning to transit from one sign to another. And Pluto is all about deep soul center change, transformation, digging deep for permanent transformation. And this is why it's such a big deal. And also Pluto can stay in each astrological sign between 12 and 30 years. So that's almost generational. So we're doing these changes almost on a generational level. And this is why this impact can be huge compared with something like, say, the moon who changes science every two and a half days. It doesn't have that greater, wider impact. So just looking at my notes here, um, Pluto also doesn't stay in the signs for equal periods of time. It is ruled by Scorpio, yet it only stays in its home sign 12 years, which is the shortest amount of time that it stays in any one sign. It stays in the opposing sign to Scorpio, which is Taurus, 30 years. And as I have mentioned, it's going to be staying in Aquarius for some 20 years. So Pluto is about transformation, about um, exposing the dirt, pulling back the veils, 
allowing all the flaws, all the aspects that have not been working for us to come to the surface, to be exposed, as well as offering solutions that will assist us in order to undertake these deep level changes that uh, is necessary. And these changes come in three stages. We have the disempowerment, we have the awareness, and then we have the final transformation because you can't transform something that you are not aware of. And you're usually only aware of something when you have lost it, which is the disempowerment. And it is this first stage, the stage of disempowerment, that the chaos and all the irrational events and conditions that we need to surrender, or even the revelation that change needs to happen, that all this comes to light. So it's interesting to look back to see what happened when Pluto was in these different signs? Because it transforms each sign that it's in. And each sign is important to just keep in mind, has a positive as well as a negative or shadow sign to it. So in the 1970s, in the early 1970s, Pluto was in Libra. And Libra is generally connected with relationships and almost immediately in the early 70s, I recall this, going to school, a lot of children were experiencing their parents breaking up. So the, the dissolvement of marriages happening all around us. Also, especially here in Australia, the laws around divorce changed. And I think that didn't take place until about 1976 where we saw the introduction of the no fault divorce. So basically you can get you could get divorced on any ground that you wanted to. Up until then you couldn't. It had to be proven that there was dishonesty, that there was abuse, that there was fraud, adultery adultery. And it was actually very difficult, especially for a woman with children to leave or divorce a man. And this is the 70s. So we're looking at, what, 40 years ago. A lot has changed in that short period of time. Then in 1983, Pluto moved into Scorpio. Scorpio is one of the signs which is connected with sexuality and sexuality. And in the early 80s, we saw the rise of the AIDS epidemic, which actually changed how we viewed, we as the collective viewed our sexual behaviours. And it wasn't just the homosexual gay communities where it was first um, taking place or was noticed in. Everybody else also had to basically face our relationship or our attitudes when it came to, in particular, unprotected sex casual sex, multiple partners, how we viewed our sexual relationships. And that was very much in the forefront. Then um, in 95, uh, Pluto moved into Sagittarius. And Sagittarius is connected with, amongst other things, religion, our belief systems. And it was in the, the 1990s that we saw the rise of religious field terrorism or fundamentalists or extremists. Not only um, Islamic groups, but also in the West within Christianity. We also saw the rise of the disclosure of the sexual abuse that was happening within relig religious institutions, i.e. the church. And it wasn't just that it was first the Catholic Church, but then it was sort of disclosed that it was in a lot of other nominations of Christianity as well, that this sexual abuse was being 
or had occurred, and it had actually occurred for a long, long time. But it was in 1995 or that, or from that time frame when Pluto had moved into Sagittarius, then all this came to light, and it still is being the light soon shined on it today. Then in 2008, um, Pluto moved into Capricorn. So, as I said, the planets. Well, the signs do have both negative and positive attributes to them. Capricorn at its best is about integrity. It's about values. It's about you know being a kind person, being an honest person, being responsible, showing up, and treating other people with respect. And these can relate to traditional values. On the flip side, we can sort of take personal, moral values or moral values ideals of a select group and then impose them upon other people and what's come to light since 2008 is a rebellion against these traditional values and such traditional values uh well were related to women being see, seen as subordinate especially to men in um, marriages or just in general and we're still seeing issues today we also saw there's a bit of a pushback against women in certain sports there's the old sort of added that you know not only can could women play certain sports that people would not watch women play certain sports so it's sort of very much this division between the genders there was also a pushback against the view that a relationship, a normal relationship, is only heterosexual. So there's a more of a wakening up and acceptance of same-sex relationships that has been extended, but it's still a lot of controversy and pushback against uh, same-sex marriage unions, adoption rights, and this saw um, a number of other holes coming into um, comparing the two different styles of relationships, in particular, uh, like the rights of partners in a heterosexual relationship when it comes to the death of a partner, that the other partner automatically has these rights to powers of attorney, to burial rights, etc., don't haven't always flowed over to the rights of partnership of people with a same sex partnership. Um, there have been instances where, say, one partner has died and the surviving partner has found that they actually do not have the rights to superannuation to even decide how their partner should be buried or cremated or if they've adopted children, what happens there so there's still loopholes in that area but it's again it's pushing back on what was considered traditional relationship or traditional marriage we've also seen in this reign of Pluto and Capricorn the sort of top-down suppression of governments of control of corporations um and that's one of the negative aspects, and we are still seeing it today, this sort of underhanded, maybe it's not it's not all that underhanded, but this increase in censorship and control, um, and all that's a lot tied in with Capricorn. I don't want to go too much into it in this video because there's another video that I want to do where I'll be hopefully talking a little bit more about about that so while Cap Pluto moves into Capricorn it is sort of interesting to look at what has occurred since it moved into Capricorn so it started in Capricorn 2008 we've seen the end of it and there have been quite a lot of interesting global events that have happened since it stepped into Capricorn. Almost straight away in 2008, we had the global financial crisis. So this resulted in 
the traditional way that we were doing business, we collective, the banks were doing business, it exposed a little bit of shady work. This is all the sub, I think it was subprime loans that were happening in America, banks lending money that they didn't have to, to other people or to th third parties who then would lend it to other people. Um, so it was like there was actually no money to be lent, but they invented this money and then th this whole system collapsed upon it and that had a sort of ricochet effect all around the world. So the, the result of that, the positive aspect of that is we had a big, overhaul of the economy or the economic structures and also the financial system so we saw an abuse of power by big banks big corporations that was exposed and needed to be transformed so we had the disempowerment then we had the awareness then we had the transformation and out of that transformation has risen also alternative currencies like the cryptocurrencies as well as um, online um, crowdfunding platforms as alternatives as opposed to using the big banks. Also connected with the sort of um, financial aspect that came a little bit later was the um, release of what was known as the Panama Papers in 2018. This was another financial scandal. This was sort of like the rogue financial dealings with offshore institutions where I think some 11 and a half million financial records were released outlining a whole system that enabled crime and collaborators and corruptions and wrongdoings, all this money being hidden in secret offshore companies. That all came to light. We also saw the release of what was called collateral damage, a video from WikiLeaks um, that showed uh, footage of a US airstrike in Afghanistan in 2007. No, it was, yeah, Afghanistan, so it was in Baghdad, where a helicopter was flying over and the crew were firing on a group of people killing a lot of them and some of these people that were killed were actually Reuter journalists and I think the biggest insult to injury was that it recorded um, some of the crew laughing and calling them collateral damage. Now this sort of exposed some of the war crimes that had happened in Afghanistan during the first Gulf War First Gulf War, Second Gulf War, one of the Gulf Wars. Um, it subsequently led to the court martial of Chelsea Manning, who was the US military and, um, intelligence analyst who released the footage, and she released it to WikiLeaks. So that saw the 14 year pursuit of Julian Assange, who was the founder of WikiLeaks. Rightly or wrongly, it sort of did raise, even here in Australia, about the conduct of our military forces in war. And not saying that they can't do the job, it's like when there are innocent people involved. In yeah, okay, no, I think enough to say about that. We also saw um, the centralization of power and authority from the top so we saw the rise of black lives matter movement we saw the the rise of the me too movement so it's sort of like power and people were feeling had had enough of the abuse of whether it was the police authority governments um there was also the harvey weinstein there was the um jeff Epstein, in relation to sexual abuse and uh, trafficking, basically. Um, in more recent times, we had seen um, charges and corruption in relation to the rapper P. Diddy. All this has been brought 
to light. So again, the hidden agendas of power, of secrecy, has been exposed in order to be transformed. And also we have seen an increasing distrust in these corporations, in power and authority figures. And this may have also stemmed from the global pandemic that I suppose originally was in 2019. I've got 2020 here because that's where it was spread out around the world. We saw the rise of, I'll say, alleged conspiracy theories, depending on what side of the fence you're on. Um, we saw... I said a huge distrust when it came to big pharma, vaccinations, science, um, government scrambling, trying to allegedly control a highly infectious outbreak that was killing a lot of people. We still have certain um, percentages of the world population today who still believe that there was no such thing as COVID each to their own. I'm not going to jump down that rabbit hole at all, but just to highlight that that brought a shift, brought a shift to how at one time we respected politicians and governments and authority figures, and now it's difficult for some people to have that trust in them. There was a positive side of it. We have moved from traditional nine to five. You have to go to the office for office workers um, where you basically had to beg, borrow and steal to get a day off. Um, heaven forbid if you had children um, and they couldn't go to school because of illness or whatever. It's, we saw the introduction of flexible, more flexible working arrangements to the extent that doesn't always suit everyone. Some people are still crying foul that there's um, not enough people coming into the city to buy the coffees in the morning to support little cafes. But from um, a city office worker, having that degree of flexibility brings back into balance our work-life need. And it's something that I know even myself for, for a long time, especially like waiting for tradie or something like that having to take a whole day off or a good part of a day off to basically be unproductive while you're waiting for someone to turn up or having a parcel delivery being able to work from home means that you don't sacrifice um, that personal time and also you can still be productive in a work-related sense as well so as i mentioned pluto is all about disempowerment awareness and transformation and it takes us both on an individual level as well as a collective level through these three stages so it's a little bit like an alchemical journey that enables us to discover our inner strength and our inner power so i guess at this stage pause for a moment and think back if you can to 2008 and where you are now. Just do a little bit of comparison, a reflection as to the changes in our life, the changes that you've gone through personally as well as collectively because it is a completely different world that we live in today. And depending on your age, you may not know realize that because this may be the world that you are familiar with even back in 2008 we weren't so high tech driven or dependent on our mobile devices either so we've seen a whole variety of this disempowerment from the overarching so institutional controls and states and corporations down to personal power We've seen what makes up a family being challenged and changed. The whole idea that we have one career or one job for our whole lifetime no longer applies. Even the expectation that when we retire, we will have a pension no longer applies. We will not be taking care of 
in the way that maybe we had initially expected. So there's a bit of an emphasis coming back to the individual to take responsibility. And this is also what Pluto has been teaching us. It's teaching us that we need to rely less on the stability that once was provided by the state or at large, and we need to be more self-reliant. We also need to be more self-sufficient. And we can do this by re-empowering ourselves, building up resilience and stepping into maybe previously unused or unutilized resources, our inner resources. Even if we are feeling a little bit crushed or suffocated by external pressures, such as what's happening these days, the rising mortgage rates and, and rent increases, job demands, even social roles. We're needing to sort of look at being a little bit more self-reliant and working, and I know Pam Gregory talks about more on grassroots level, like farmers markets. If we have a place where we can grow vegetables, can we do like a veggie swap, um, book libraries and things like that? Maybe extend that concept to things that we are I want to look at what we are sort of downsizing, we're needing to downsize and donate to charities, to um, Goodwill and all those organisations as well. And all of these things are actually creating a deeper degree of awareness, which, of course, leads through to transformation. So now we're coming back to the 19th of November when Pluto moves into Aquarius. Aquarius is a fixed air sign. It's connected with technology and invention. It's it show us a different light as to how we view society as being structured. Um, as I mentioned, Pam Guri talks about it moving from the power of the state, corporations, which is Capricorn, to the power of the people, which is Aquarius. And around this time, throughout history, there has often been revolutions. Now, we've just recently, we, the world, in, or that she was in America, we had the US election, and because of the US, perhaps the US affects all of us, and... Trump was re-elected. Now, is this a sign of rebellion, I wonder? It could be a sign of Aquarius taking form because the opposite astrological sign to Aquarius, sorry, of Uranus. Uranus is the opposite sign to Aquarius. Um, and Aquarius could have been having some sort of impact for the result of the election. Who knows? It's interesting to sort of put out um, explanations or why we struggle for answers as to why. I said maybe it is this rebellious aspect that the people wanted to express because they felt this control of the still current government was not working for all and we'll see how it pans out so as we go forward it's important to or we can get some ideas when we look back so the last time pluto was especially these early stages of aquarius which is from zero to seven degrees was in april 1777 and it's so the last there until December 1782. And there are some interesting past events that, who knows, might shed some light as to what we can experience. So, of course, the most important thing around that time for a lot of us was the American Revolution. And in 1778, France joined the US. 
And this was one of the turning points. Um, according to a lot of um, historians, it came with great financial cost to France, however. But that was because of the actions of one man. And his name was Necker, who became the director of the French finances. And he took out loans instead of raising taxes to fund the US war. And he also prepared a public report um, of the state's financial situation. So making everything sort of more transparent, which had not been done before. And it's quite interesting because at the time, the king of France, who was Louis the 16th, he was very angry with what had happened and actually dismissed Necker. Um, and as it turned out, Necker had grossly miscalculated or hidden a lot of the spending. And this actually set the stage for the next revolution, which was the French Revolution. So if we sort of fast forward it a little bit into our current times in 2008, as I mentioned, uh, we saw the financial crisis that emerged over out of these huge flaws in the US banking system and spread around the world. Again, hidden money, unexistent money, hidden um, corrupt or suspect banking practices that were exposed and caused greater damage. So in 1782, the US, so the English Parliament actually decided to vote against continuous support of the US war. And a year later, of course, the formal American document of independence was signed. Then another interesting fact that also happened around that time frame. So in 1783 to 1784, the Iceland, Icelandic volcano Laki erupted. And not only did this eruption kill most of Iceland's livestock, which resulted in the death of, I think, about a quarter of the population due to the ongoing or connected famine, but the volcanic eruption actually had a cooling effect on Europe's climate. And this cooling effect resulted in cooler and rainy summers, which flowed on to devastating harvests for a number of years. And again, as people starved, this was another instigating point that led to the French Revolution. So we had two points. We had the hidden money of Necker, who was funding the US Revolution, when it was exposed, it left France in a very bad financial space, which caused the king to start to increase the taxes, which, of course, is always the bottom people of the food chain here effect. And then also the, the eruption of the Icelandic volcano caused a lot of devastation of the halves around Europe, which also added to or caused the people they had had enough to rise up against that establishment. So I guess what does this all mean for us today? We have a current, currently we have a number of global situations occurring. Will this mean additional parties getting involved in these wars as the French did? with the US war. We see the enhancement and the advancements in relation to AI technology, as well as the costs that this is beginning to impact upon the individual. And I've definitely noticed that certain search engines, even on my computer, 
are showing me AI information first, AI content, regardless of whether I have asked for it or not, which I don't know. I'm personally a little bit unsettled by it. It's just it's not what I'm wanting. Um, I don't like the idea that I have to opt out of something being forced upon me. Some change being forced upon me. Maybe this is just because I'm a bit older. I'd rather have the choice of do I want to add it into my life or, or have my life currently without it. But it's not all, I guess, all doom and gloom. There's also um, an element of charisma when it comes to Pluto. As I said, he's also connected with the minerals and the crystals and the riches of the underworld. So we could actually see, as what came out of the French and the US revolutions, a new style of leadership. And up to now, we have had rather conservative middle row governments, governments that may have, when they've been elected, under the belief that they were progressive, have actually turned, especially in more recent times, to be very conservative. Probably not far right conservative, but they definitely are not as progressive as a left-wing government should be or was hoped to be. Again, maybe this is why Trump was elected in as a bit of the rebellion aspect. We do need new leaders. We do need sort of a new visionaries. We also need people who can take responsibility for the actions that they make and maybe be a bit more discerning when their actions or their direction, especially from government or corporations, affect the wider populace. So what we can do, if you've got your natal chart, look to see where Aquarius is, what so you do what house it's in. Um, also consider opposite Taurus. See what house Taurus is in, because Taurus will actually Taurus is Taurus is actually squared to Aquarius because that also means that when Pluto moves into Aquarius, it will be squaring Taurus. And in doing so, creating a potential growth and opportunity that could be heralded in probably with a degree of drama in your life as well, but there's this shedding of the skin for newness or a healing crisis could occur and it's where we will emerge from. It's all about the transformation. And even on the more psychological level, I guess, it could actually be happening inside of us as well. It could be about changing our thoughts, looking at us and how we interact with the world going through change as well. And how Gambata sat under the Buddha tree and became the Buddha where he received total enlightenment. So maybe it, this is all about this gaining this wisdom within in order for us to project it out, taking more responsibility for ourselves. So a bit of a long-winded video, um, lots of things to think about. A lot of looking back at the past, see where we've gone through to give us some pointers. doesn't mean that we will be repeating the past. It just there is the sort of when especially these bigger planets, these outer planets change size. The energy is very chaotic, very heavy. Um, look at your self-care methods, breathing, breath work, meditation, grounding. It's all about change and transformation. And I do feel that um, if we're looking at the history of what's happened when Pluto has changed signs, especially moving into Aquarius, 
it has been very chaotic for a while, like a couple of years. So sometimes we just need to breathe and learn to paddle, or float, keep our head above water. But we will get through this because we have in the past. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. If this video has been of interest to you, please just leave comments below. So I'm not an astrologer. Also check out the astrologers that I have used and utilized to put this information together. Um, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, please consider subscribing. That way you do support the work that I do and uh, I'm able to offer more. I feel more inspired to offer more. Uh, otherwise, breathe. We will get through this and I'll see you again later. Blessings.